Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Kramsurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So uh, this, is a, this paper was a really good um, uh, paper to discuss, uh, and we thought we should talk about the RDL framework uh, alongside this paper. Uh, the RDL framework is something that is increasingly talked about in the surgical literature. Um, so it'll be good for students interested in surgery and trainees to, to uh, know what this is all about. So essentially, this is a framework that describes the stages through which a surgical innovation goes through or should go through as part of the evolution of the treatment or the innovation from just an idea to its incorporation into clinical practice. So just like we uh, have seen in this paper and um, it has been described, there are five stages and the stages are the idea stage, the development stage, the exploration stage, the assessment stage, and the long-term study stage. Now, uh, there's a lot of detail on the ideal framework on the website run by the ideal collaboration. And there's the uh, URL for the website and you can get all sorts of detail about how this was developed um, on the website um, in the form of a number of papers. Now I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, without going into too much detail. Now, before we talk of the, of the ideal framework, I thought we should um, clarify or explain what the issue is. What is the problem that led to this framework being developed? Now, surgical interventions, uh, I'm sure you'd agree, do need to be assessed just like any medicine or drug intervention in terms of are they effective? What are the risks? and do benefits outweigh the risks involved, yeah? And if you have a new surgical uh, innovation or intervention, then you want to know whether that new intervention is better compared to the standard. And the word better is quite uh, complicated. Better in what way? Um, better for the patient in what particular aspect uh, is important to define. Often, the benefits are pretty obvious. The benefit to risk ratio is huge and the intervention has a clear explanation of biological rationale. And this often has happened historically in surgical innovations. And that's why surgical innovations, you could argue, probably were not as comprehensively assessed as drugs, if you like. And some examples include overrunning a bleeding artery, this obvious benefit, and fixing a fracture, laparotomy for peritonitis, closing a DU perforation. So these are um, interventions that, that, where the benefit is so clear cut and so obvious that you're not really going to be doing a randomized controlled trial. There was, as uh, some people may know, a satirical article in the BMJ some years ago that talked about how to assess the effectiveness of using a parachute when you want to jump off from an airplane. So um, just to make the point that when the benefit is so obvious, uh, you know, what is the point of detailed assessments and uh, um, evaluations? However, there are many other surgical interventions that have a much more nuanced benefit, if at all there is benefit. And some examples from general surgical and literature, if you like, would be radiofrequency ablation of liver metastasis, robotic versus laparoscopic gastrectomy, or for that mat matter, transoral thyroid surgery versus open thyroid surgery um, would also be an intervention or a comparison where the benefits are not very clear. Now, if the benefits are not very clear, then obviously they need to be assessed. But historically, what's happened is many interventions have been int introduced into surgical practice by expert surgeons, uh, by leading surgeons of the day um, who have trialed and errored uh, in uh, using these interventions, who reported in retrospective studies that in their hands from centers of excellence, the in interventions are great. And these interventions have found a way into routine surgical practice. Now, some of them, such as laparoscopic cholecystectomy, have been a success. They've not been really proven to be of, ben uh, of benefit, 
compared to open cholecystectomy in a randomized controlled trial. But nowadays, a standard gallbladder operation is a laparoscopic operation. There are many examples, unfortunately, of not so su successful examples like gastrojejunostomy that used to be done for benign or malignant um, gastric outlet obstruction uh, in many centers, in many series, it used to be done without vagotomy. And if you don't resect the vagus, at the time of a gastrojejunostomy, you end up with severe and, um, and uh, painful anastomotic ulcerations. Another not so successful example is jejunal ileal bypass for obesity uh, that um, unfortunately caused cirrhosis in many patients and death. So, so that's why um, interventions need to be assessed. Now, I thought it'd be useful to pause for a moment and think about what drives innovation in surgery, what makes surgeons innovators. Now, the first um, obvious uh, reason or factor would be the, the desire to innovate and to improve your patient outcomes. Cynics would say it's surgical ego that partly drives innovation, and maybe the reward, uh, monetary or otherwise, that also drives innovation. A lot of innovation, um, like we've discussed, can be driven by industry and some by patients. And also there, there is uh, the other group of stakeholders who are the healthcare providers, hospitals and trusts, who can drive innovation because uh, they want to increase efficiency and reduce costs of care. Now, that is fine, your driving innovation is good, but how do you assess the innovation? Um, and and uh, I'm sure uh, people will agree that the assessment of surgical innovation should be on par with medical innovation. In other words, drug development. Now you may know that drug development goes through a number of phases, phase one, two, three, and four, and um, it is quite stringent and rigorous. And same should be the case for surgical innovation, especially when the benefits are not very obvious. And this will then form the basis of evidence-based surgical practice, which is what we all aim to do. However, there are some problems. Um, assessment of surgical innovation is not straightforward. So let's just look at uh, some of the difficulties in assessing surgical interventions, uh, as opposed to um, assessing drug interventions. Now, let's just uh, think of an example and talk through the difficulties. Now let's just consider the example of assessing laparoscopic right hemicolectomy for cecal cancer. And uh, the research question is, is that better than open? And um, in terms of recurrence, reducing recurrence and improving survival. Okay, so let's assume that that is your question and the in uh, innovation is laparoscopic hemicolectomy. Now, the first thing you probably will realize, especially in comparison with drugs, is that these interventions are complex. Now, complex interventions are particularly difficult to assess. Um, but before we go any further, we need to understand what a complex intervention is. Now, as um, described by the Medical Research Council, a complex intervention includes more than one component. There is flexibility in delivery and adherence to the way the intervention is implemented. And there could be interactions between the various components of the intervention and between the components and the context. So what, this, uh, what do these all mean in the context of laparoscopic right hemicolectomy? Now, there are various parts to a laparoscopic operation that are very distinct and different from an open operation. Laparoscopic operations can be done in many different ways. And even if you find an optimum way and ask surgeons to do it that way, there'll be a lot of variation and there will be very little adherence to the so-called optimum way. And also there's so many interactions going on between the laparoscopic performance of the operation and the environment, the anesthetic team, the scrub team, the availability of other equipment in, in the operating room and so on. There are also a large number of confounding variables. I mean, confounding variables would be there in drug trials as well, but this is much more a problem in surgical trials. There is the influence of preoperative management, postoperative care, intensive care, and so on and so forth. The other big problem, unlike drug trials, is the learning curve. The surgeons need to do uh, X number of procedures to become adept at it, and that can vary from one intervention to another. And that can have a huge impact in biasing the results of a trial, exploring the role of a new 
and technology. The other problem is that there's ongoing innovation of the intervention. So you've got a laparoscopic intervention that you want to study in a trial, but you will find that surgeons, as they do more and more of that particular kind of operation, will get better and better at it because they'll find newer tips and techniques that improve their ability to do that particular operation laparoscopically. So that'll be a problem. And this then leads on to when would you do a comparative assessment of a new technology? Do you wait for a large group of surgeons to become really adept and masters at this new technology? Or do you do this assessment quite early on with only a few adopters? And there's a guy called Buxton who proposed a law, a bit paradoxical law, where he said it's always too early to assess a technology until certainly it is too late. So these are all some of the difficulties in assessing surgical um, technologies. Now, the ideal framework hopes to address these challenges, and it's partly based on uh, quite detailed guidance provided by the Medical Research Council on complex interventions. They published some initial guidance in 2000, revised it a couple of times, and there's a full paper in the BMJ, and the link is here if you want to look at this guidance on complex interventions. Now, this does not just include surgery, it is all sorts of non-pharmacological interventions like surgery, like physical therapy, um, interventions in uh, radiology and radiation oncology, and so on. Now, it's quite extensive guidance, but I'll just um, go through a few general principles. Now, the guidance emphasizes that you have to go through iterative phases, so repeated phases of development and evaluation at each phase. They also emphasize that you use experimental designs wherever possible and not rely on retrospective case series. The guidance emphasizes that you measure not only outcomes, but also processes and processes by which you went through the development of the technique. And, and they advise that you describe the interventions and components in detail, the components of the technology and the intervention so that others can reproduce um, uh, uh, your intervention. It also enables synthesis of the evidence and implementing the intervention in practice if you've described them in quite a lot of detail. Right, so back to the ideal framework. I'll go through a few slides um, describing the various stages. The first is a preclinical stage. Uh, it was um, called stage zero in one of the earlier versions of the ideal framework. And basically it addresses the question, can the idea work, does the idea work before you've tried it in humans? So it is aimed to demonstrate proof of concept and safety prior to human experimentation. And the studies typically involve animals or simulators or models or a virtual or augmented reality. So you want to develop the technique as far as possible prior to your first in human studies. And safety is a major issue that needs to be explored. Okay, the second um, stage, or actually stage one, is the idea stage, which just then progresses the idea onto humans, again to demonstrate proof of concept and safety, and they're typically referred to as first in human studies, and they're usually single case reports or sometimes case series. And, uh, and they're quite selective, um, usually very selective, and uh, that they're done by a very small group of surgeons, sometimes just one surgeon. And a careful assessment should be made of all of the potential risks and benefits before going on to the next stage. The next stage, 2A, is a development stage, which addresses the question, has the intervention developed to a stage of reproducibility? Can lots of other people um, use the intervention and do it in a similar manner? And in this stage, the technique is optimized and the efficacy of the technique um, uh, is improved, or you make attempts to improve the efficacy. And essentially this involves larger series of patients, and again, usually single arm studies, in just a few centers or a few hands. And uh, traditionally, there are a number of innovations that have gone through this stage historically, but they have generally been retrospective. And the ideal framework discourages this, they advise prospective well-planned studies. Ideally, they need to be registered um, and, and um, done with appropriate informed consent and ethics approval. 
The next stage to be is the exploration stage where once you've developed the technique, you want to see whether it is ready to be tested in, a, in an RCT. So this is a pre-RCT phase. And the um, stage ex aims to explore utility in different cohorts of patients, different groups of patients, different indications, and um, should demonstrate reproducibility and improve efficiency. So those would be the uh, general aims of this stage. The kinds of studies that uh, are usually involved are multicenter studies, occasionally comparative studies or um, explanatory RCTs or mechanistic RCTs, where you're focusing um, particularly on um, can the technique work and, and, and then you do a comparative um, randomized control trial. Um, so you don't have to do a comparative randomized control trial. You could do a single arm study, but again, the framework encourages prospective studies as opposed to retrospective single arm studies. The next is stage three or the assessment stage. And this is a stage where you really want to know if the intervention is better than current practice, if the technology is better than current practice. So you've got to compare the intervention against current treatments, usually in a multi-centered randomized controlled trial. Now, occasionally, like I mentioned before, Randomized control trials are not needed when the benefits are huge and obvious, such as in heart transplantation or liver transplantation. And occasionally, RCTs are just not feasible. And in this scenario, there are some alternative study designs that have been proposed by the ideal framework. One example is the parallel non-randomized studies. Now, one of the things you've got to keep in mind is that if the technology is, it has been adopted in many, many centers in, let's say, uh, for example, in the UK, and surgeons are getting used to the technique and technology and like it and think that it is, um, it provides, it improves patient outcomes, it might be difficult to then conduct an RCT. It might be that the, it, it's a bit too late to conduct a, a randomized control trial, just like what happened with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The final stage, uh, stage four, long-term study, uh, where you want to ensure that rare outcomes or outcomes that present much later are, uh, are measured and evaluated. And also you're able to evaluate trends or changes in the indications for that uh, technology um, and changes in how the technology is actually delivered over time. So for this, you would do longitudinal observational studies and, and the framework encourages the establishment of registries, registries that are either disease-based or procedure-based, and they encourage people to uh, take part in the registry and put the data in the registry so that the technology can be evaluated in the long term. Okay, so... In general, there are a few things to keep in mind when, when, you, um, when you talk about the ideal framework. The first thing is that the framework emphasizes that your innovation should go hand in hand with your assessment. And this should be in a continuous iterative manner right from the idea stage through to the implementation stage. Yeah, so that's fairly uh, um, obvious. The other thing they encourage is that um, as much as possible, the studies should be prospective, they should be planned really well, and the protocols should be published. And in addition to measuring outcomes that include the technical aspects of the innovation, clinical benefits and harm should be assessed right from early on, right from your stage one, possibly even stage zero, you should be looking for safety and clinical benefits. They also en en encourage comprehensive reporting and publication at every stage um, of your uh, development. Now, if you uh, are trying out a technology and, you, and it doesn't really work, and you write a paper that says that the technology doesn't work, that's gonna be very difficult to publish. And for this reason, uh, the framework encourages societies and journals to establish registries and for people to be able to put their work in and for people's negative results to be acknowledged uh, so that others don't repeat the same work. Now, I've got this chart. I won't go into uh, this chart in too much detail, but this is from the IDEAL website. And if you have a technology um, 
and a report or reports and you want to see what stage that particular technology is at, then you can just go through uh, the this flowchart and then um, figure out at what stage your technology is at and how to take it further. So uh, you just go through the questions on this flowchart and then you figure out whether you are in a preclinical stage zero or whether it's a first in human study, which will be stage one, or whether it's at the development stage or an exploratory stage and so on and so forth. Okay, limitations. So one of the things I had a problem with uh, reading through the ideal framework papers is figuring out what exactly a, an innovation is. Any little improvement in the way you do a particular operation is that innovation. Uh, so it becomes a bit difficult to, to clearly define innovation and the scope of um, the, this issue. Because if you do a particular procedure many times over months to years, you will gradually often make changes and you will improvise. You will use your creativity to improve patient outcomes in a number of different ways. And in some instances, after about 10 years, you will be doing the procedure in an entirely different way, potentially. So these changes are slow, gradual, and they naturally occur. And then uh, you're not really sure whether you call it innovation. And when do you say enough changes happen to call it an innovation? And along these lines, people have recognized that uh, sometimes innovation happens but it's not recognized as an innovation and you often recognize it quite late on and it may be in stage um, 2b or 3 and you may not have done the uh, earlier aspects of the development according to the guidance provided in the ideal framework. Some people think this, this framework is not necessarily new. Many innovations have been through the stages that have been described. However, I would also say that many uh, innovations in surgery have fallen by the wayside after having been uh, used in hundreds of thousands of patients and then shown to be ineffective or harmful. And potentially, if those innovations have been, uh, had been adopted using the ideal framework, then the harm associated with those interventions could po possibly have been avoided. The other uh, final issue I have with the ideal framework is that uh, there's very little focus on the problem that the innovation is aiming to address. So what is the burden of disease that the innovation is addressing and how significant should that be and how should that be quantified prior to the innovation going to the stages hasn't really been uh, addressed. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, and it's a useful set of guidelines on processes to adopt when you are considering a new intervention, when you're exploring a technology. Just to recap, IDEA stands for idea, development, exploration, assessment, and long-term study. There is a preclinical stage, um, which is essentially um, uh, stage zero. There are some modifications to the ideal framework because um, if you think about complex interventions is so vast and there are so, so many different types that some groups have uh, come forward and proposed their own modifications of the ideal framework. So there's an ideal device. That's a modification of the ideal framework just for devices. There is an R ideal, which is used apparently by radiation oncology researchers for their particular speciality. There's an ideal physio, um, which is apparently useful for physical um, therapy interventions and so on. And I'm sure there'll be many more to come. The key is that IDEAL is increasingly recognized and accepted by many, many national and international organizations and regulatory bodies. So as surgeons, surgical trainees, and students interested in surgery, it's important to understand what this is all about. There's uh, updates available at the website. I'm sure there'll be many more updates to come. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is, um, this link uh, is probably the best way to uh, keep yourself abreast of what's happening or when you're considering a technology, uh, make sure you look up the ideal website and go through the updates. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. Yeah.